Exodus chapter 14 this evening. You remember in our last Exodus study, <clears throat> we looked at the Passover, we saw the children of Israel leaving Egypt, and in verse 20 of chapter 13 it says, they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness, and the Lord went before them by day in a column of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a column of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. And it appears it was one pillar of cloud, the cloud in part of it, and a fire in the other part, and there was just one cloud with different areas. We'll see that as we go on further in Exodus. It'll be, become more uh, clear on that. He did not take away that pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So we saw that as God's presence, the the Holy Spirit there with them, leading them out of Egypt and all. And we talked about the presence of God in a life and the, the presence of God leading and guiding and that we'll never see that until after we see, as we saw here in this Exodus account, until the blood of the Lamb has been applied to a person individually. And once we come under the blood of the Lamb, then the presence of God is there with us wherever we go day and night, never to leave us, never to forsake us and all. We get into chapter 14 now. It's the, the crossing of the Red Sea. Now, the crossing of the Red Sea is one of these events that shows up throughout the Old Testament. This becomes a major event showing the power of God, showing the glory of God. In fact, the children of Israel will often point to this event to show the power of God. This is a major event. Let's take a quick look at just a couple of them. If we turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah, we go to the book of Isaiah, and we get to chapter 51, Isaiah 51. It says there, but I am the, verse 15, but I am the Lord your God, who divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. This is one of so many places I found this reference made to God parting the Red Sea, showing the power of God. And he's the army, he's the leader of the army of hosts and all. If we look at the book of Nahum, or Nahum, uh, a minor prophet, and we look at the, the book of Nahum. Those of you that are in class, think of Minnesota, and you'll find Nahum. There's Nahum right there. So we want to go to Nahum, and we go to chapter 1. And we look at verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Again, here's this emphasis on power. He will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirl whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. We see here even Nahum, this prophet years later, refers to the drying up of the sea, speaking of the power of God. So this is one of these events, and we'll see it throughout the Old Testament, the power of God demonstrated here in this event, this drying up of the Red Sea, this splitting of the Red Sea. Even the unbelievers, or the, even the enemies of God, recognize this event as a demonstration of the power of God. When the fellows were teaching in Joshua, remember in Joshua chapter 2, in Joshua chapter 2 here, we take a look at verse 10, and Rahab's talking, and what does she say? For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. So here are the people of Jericho. They heard about this event, this, this amazing event. So believers and unbelievers point to this event we're going to be looking at tonight and say, man, this is some serious stuff here. This is going to be a miracle of miracles here. In fact, it has been suggested, and I can understand why, that the crossing, the parting of the Red Sea is to the Old Testament what the resurrection is to the New Testament. It is a very outward, very obvious illustration of the power of God. So this parting of the Red Sea is a big time event here. And it's interesting because when you look at the parting of the Red Sea or if you look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, believers have no problem grasping either one 
and unbelievers struggle with both of them. The unbeliever will look, well, you understand, in Hebrew, the, the word for red is really reed. It's really the reed sea. So they walked across this reed sea. It was probably 18 inches deep, you know. The reeds were sticking out, and they walked across the reed sea. And they said, oh, they crossed the reed sea. And they said, that's no miracle. And if it was the reed sea, I'd have to agree. That's not a major miracle. The real miracle is that God drowned thousands upon thousands of Egyptian special forces in 18 inches of water. So you can't have it both ways. But the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea, but for an unbeliever, that's an issue. For a believer, it's not an issue for one major reason. An unbeliever removes God. He blocks God from the events of this world. A believer embraces God in the events of this world. To someone who knows the Lord, a miracle is not a surprise. It's expected. We expect God to work. And we understand that all things are possible with God. Amen. So we hear the Red Sea part. Well, yeah, okay. Jesus rose from the dead. Well, yeah, he sure did. I've talked with him today. I know he's alive. Amen. So that's not an issue. If you don't know the Lord, it's foolishness. And you try and remove God from these major situations. So tonight we're going to just be looking at this event that is just phenomenal and there's so much practical stuff we're we're only going to be in the word about 40 minutes tonight i think it's not going to be a long teaching but it's going to be extremely practical because we're going to see god taking his people and putting them in a situation that looks like there's no way nowhere no way out we're going to see god <clears throat> taking all of his people and putting it between two mountains up against a sea there's nowhere to go and then close in on them. And it's going to be like, well, this is it. And we're going to see, why would God do that to his people? In fact, we're going to re be reminded he does it to us sometimes too, does he not? It's like, oh. <laughs> and we're going to see, well, why would God do that? What does he have for us? So we're going to be looking at, at that tonight as we get to see God's power displayed. So that's what we'll be looking at tonight as we get in chapter 14. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses. Remember that. That's going to be key. This is God's idea, not Moses' idea. This is God's idea. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn. They were on their way to the promised land, getting ready to go through the land of the Philistines, right along the Mediterranean Sea, two-week journey, boom, they're there. And God says, Now speak to the Israel that they turn. They're going to turn off the main road and camp before Pi Hieroth, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. Now, if you look up the meanings to these, these places, it's interesting. We're not really sure where these places are because they're out in this area, this wilderness area, and the terrain changes all the time. We don't know for sure where the crossing of the Red Sea took place. There's all kinds of, of possibilities. These places don't exist, but there's all kinds of different people. So we think it's this, we think it's that. We don't know for sure. What we do know for sure is they crossed the Red Sea. What we do know for sure, this was the names, these were the names of the places. This Pi Hieroth means the, the place of liberty, which is this interesting to me, the place of freedom, the place of being set free. He says, go down there, camp at the place to be set free, right between Migdal, which means a fortress or a tower, and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, which means the Lord of the North. And from the North, as you know in Scripture, was the direction that judgment would come on God's people. When judgment came, it came from the North. So it's the Lord of judgment, we could say. So it's an interesting picture. He says, go camp there in this place of liberty between the, the fortress and the place of judgment. And we're going to see how this tower of of this cloud and this fire, this tower of cloud and fire is going to come between the children of Israel, between God's people and the enemy. And in, for one, it's going to be a refuge, and for the other, it's going to be a source of judgment. And it's interesting, the name play in Hebrew, that's always kind of key in the, in the, the Hebrew language. So you get this word play setting the, the, setting the scene. So as we look at this, God is taking them into a cul-de-sac, basically. Got a mountain on one side, a mountain on the other side, a sea in front of you. There's nowhere to go. They're in a cul-de-sac. If you've ever been chased by anybody in your car and you go into a cul-de-sac, it wasn't that many years ago. I was driving a Montgomery going home, and um, Connie had asked me to stop. It was right before Thanksgiving, stop at this grocery store there and just pick something up on my way home. So 
I did, and I slowed down, and all of a sudden, boom, got hit. That was when I got hit three times, remember, in like three months. And this guy just ran right into me, boom. And I go, whoa, he hit me. And then he just took off. Had his cap on backwards. I could see the color of his, the tone of his skin. It was dark complected, so I figured it was an African-American kid with the cap on backwards. He took off. And this was my third hit. I said, oh, no, you're not. So I chased him. And we were tooling down Montgomery, man. We were going. And then he turned on Pennsylvania. I turned on Pennsylvania. And he turned in the bank, and it's like a little cul-de-sac dead end. I go, I got him. And that dawned on me, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I got him. Now what? So I just pulled up on him. He got out of the car. He'd cap on backwards. And it was an African-American gentleman. He came walking at me, madder in the way, and dropping F-bombs every which way. And I just got out and said, whoa, 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 whoa. I talked to him. And it was about a 75, 80-year-old man. He was madder in a wet hand. Don't call the police. Don't call the police on me. So, whoa, whoa, settle down, you know. And uh, we talked. We worked out something. I didn't call the police because he didn't have a license. And I said, you damaged my car. I looked at his car. Was, I said, you have any damage? And I looked at it. And the bumper was already falling off beforehand. You can see it was a beater. And I'm like, well, I said, what are we going to do here? Well, don't call the police. I won't call the police. So I didn't call the police. So I'll pay you 50 bucks a month. I said, great. That's a deal. So every month, he paid me 50 bucks a month for eight or nine months. Right in my office, he'd come in like clockwork. And we became friends. And he wanted to come up and do worship for us. But we have a requirement to lead worship. You got to know Jesus. So he didn't come up and do worship, but talked with them. I had a chance to witness to him. He had some issues, and it worked. But anyway, I'll just say cul-de-sac. When you get pinned in, there's nowhere to go. And that's where these guys are. They get pinned in. And they're pinned in right now. Keep that in mind. They're pinned in. So he camps them there. And it's like, what? And little do they know, the Egyptians or the children of Israel, this is a God-ordained ambush. This is all in God's hands. God's kids are pinned in. Nowhere to go. They're in trouble. And things are being squeezed in. They got, ah, well, there's no way. And God said, you watch. Now you've got to have to look to me. Now you cannot figure it out yourself. You're going to have to just trust me. That's what we're going to see here. And we're going to see what they do to the Egyptians too because God does something to the Egyptians. Notice what he tells Moses. He says, this is sort of like a, a, almost a parenthetical little phrase. He talks to Moses. He says, go there, camp before the sea. Then he says, for Pharaoh is going to say to, of the children of Israel, hey, look at them. They're, they're lost out there. They're bewildered by the land. They, they, They've been in Egypt for 400 years. They don't know where they're going. The wilderness has closed them in. God says, then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. Pharaoh just seems to be bent on self-destruction. Over and over and over again, we've seen God with these plagues. I'm going to introduce myself to you. Let my people go, and I'll get rid of this. Okay, change his mind, change his mind. Eventually, it costs him the death of his firstborn son and every family in Egypt. And they're mourning probably a three-day time by the time they get done with everything. They're expecting children of Israel to go three days in the wilderness. That's what they said they're going to do. Now, all of a sudden, they're really going, but they're, they're wandering out here, and they're trapped. Let's go get them. They turn their heart. And the ten plagues become a distant memory to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He says, let's pursue him. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Remember Pharaoh at the beginning? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? God's got one more lesson for them, and that is the army, the military strength the Egyptians have been putting their faith in. He's shown that he's greater than all of their gods, but they've got this military, the Hiskos, Pharaoh had introduced chariots to Egypt. And now whether it's a Hiskos Pharaoh or if it's an Egyptian Pharaoh, the chariots are there and they've really ratcheted up their army. The Egyptian chariots are different than the Hittite chariots, than the Philistine chariots. The Egyptian chariots were three-man chariots. They had their charioteur, the driver, and they had two warriors on that chariot. It was a different, bigger chariot, and they had two fighters on each chariot. And it says here they, that, uh, where are we here? Oh, the army. So he's going to go after their army. Notice what it says at the end of verse 4. 
and they did so. So the children of Israel are obeying right now. God says, camp here in this cul-de-sac, if you will, and I'm going to send, I'm going to bring Egypt on in. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled in the heart of Pharaoh and his servants. These are the same servants that were in chapter 10, verse 7. They said, Pharaoh, let them go. We're all going to be dead here. Let them go. Those same servants now have their heart changed too. So the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. You see, God can do that with the Egyptians. He can take the leader and change his heart and create followers that will follow Pharaoh blindly. And that's what they're doing. And they said, why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us? Why did we let him go? And I, I wrote my Bible, I can think of 10 good reasons why you let them go. Those plagues, remember the plagues, but how quickly we forget the judgment of God, you know. So he made ready his chariot and he took his people with him. Here it is. Also he took 600 choice chariots. The word for choice there is actually three. That three-man chariot is the reference there. So he took the 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. Again, in my Bible, I just wrote Egyptian special forces. So these are the elite fighters of Egypt. So Pharaoh calls out the heavy hitters, let's go get them. This has been their workforce. This is what keeps their infrastructure going, their economy going. We let them go, let's go get them. So off they go. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. Look at that word boldness, interesting word. It's, it means rebellion. So they went out like we are out of here. And you can almost see them going 400 years there and now God has given them favor. And we, the, if I'm an Egyptian and you, they're, you're in the front row, so it's gonna, be, it's gonna be you girl. So you come up and say, I want your stuff. And God gave you favor. And I said, you can have my stuff. And off you go. And then as, as this happens, and then the next one and all of the priests and all of us are just taking stuff from the Egyptians and we're going out with, yeah. We are rebelling against the Egyptians. God has given us favor. We are so out of here. So they're not slithering away. They are, we are out of here. I wrote again in my Bible, righteous rebellion. There is such a thing as righteous rebellion. And this is a perfect example of it. They went out with boldness. They are rebelling against their leaders, but it is God ordained and God led. And out they go with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them all the horses, all the chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and they overtook him by camp they overtook them camping by the sea, besides Piharoth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes to the Lord. Oh no, it doesn't say that. They lifted their eyes and behold the Egyptians. They're pinned in in this cul-de-sac. They looked behind him, and here comes Pharaoh, his special forces, all of his army, the most powerful army at that time in the world. They're pinned in, and they look at the pressure that's coming in on them. They're feeling squeezed. Who hasn't been there? Well, you just feel the squeeze of the world, you feel the squeeze. It's like, we got nowhere to go. God, uh, I've been following you. How did I get here? But isn't that just like the enemy? These would be a picture of what we call new believers. They've just placed their faith in the blood of the Lamb. They're heading out of Egypt. And at the very beginning, the first thing we see is Pharaoh coming after him. Remember, Pharaoh's a picture, a type of Satan. When you come to Christ, the enemy isn't all happy about that. And it's like, well, I came to Christ, so I guess I'm good to go. No, we're not good to go. Expect the enemy to come in against you. And that's exactly what happens here. The enemy comes in against them. So here comes Pharaoh, and what do they do? They look at him. They look at the Egyptians. They lift up their eyes, and there the Egyptians are marching after them. Well, whenever we look at the circumstances, this is what we get. They were not afraid. They were very afraid. 
Remember Peter getting out of the boat in the Sea of Galilee. He looked at Jesus. He was walking above the waves, walking above the storm. Then he looked down and saw the waves. He started to sink. Same principle. We get our eyes off the Lord. We get him on to the storm. We get him on to the Egyptians, in quote, into the pressure that comes on. And then we try to fix it ourselves. Do we not? We got to figure out a way to do this. We're going to see why God does that in just a minute. It's amazing some of the, the principles come flying out of this chapter. They lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And it sounds so good. The children of Israel cried out to the Lord. We go, yes, that's good. We're freaking out. Lord, they cry out to the Lord, but notice what they cry out and do. They cry out to the Lord complaining. <laughs> it's like, okay. So they cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? That is one of the craziest things that could ever come from the mouth of anybody at this time. Egypt is a graveyard. That's what Egypt is. The pyramids, those are tombs. They've got mummies all over Egypt. And, and it's crazy because their whole thing with the Egyptian religion was preserve the bodies. So our embalming comes from Egypt. But our embalming is nothing compared to Egypt. We talked about it last night. Embalming, Dr. Robert Holmes, 1858. We had to test question. You got to know that for the boards. But you got to know Dr. Robert Holmes. He's the father of American embalming. It's always good to be known for something. Can you imagine being known? Oh, I'm the father of American embalming. Okay, but that's, that's, that's Dr. Holmes. But the purpose for embalming in America is for public health. So we don't go for preservation. That's a side effect of it. The Egyptians embalmed for preservation. It was a religious issue. They believed that when the soul died, or when the person died, the soul left the body and went into a rabbit, went into a dog, went into a cow, and they figured out if it went to every known species of animal, insect, and fish, it would take about 3,000 years. And then they taught in their religion that after that journey of 3,000 years, getting all the wisdom of all these animals, fish, and crickets, and everything, then you would come back to your body with all this wisdom. Well, you got to have a body to come back to. So their goal was preserve the body so it would last 3,000 years. They outdid themselves. They, they, they just opened up a couple more tombs and unwrapped some of these mummies. So it worked. But we had to study the whole, how did the Egyptians do this? How they would go, they would empty organs without cutting open much of the body even. They would empty the brain through the nose, the cribiform plate, and they just pull it out and put it in canopic, canopic jars. And they put their organs, they had four canopic jars, and they'd put each organ in each canopic jar and put this natron solution and all this stuff. Yeah, I know, we're getting the detail. But that's what they did. And then they would wrap the inside of the body, and then they would actually pickle the body. They would put the body in the natron solution, a salt solution, like you do with cucumbers. And they would pickle you, and then they would bury you in this dry sand where there's no, or no uh, humidity. Or they'd put you in these tombs, and it was preservation. But because there's preservation, there's graves everywhere. And they're saying, because there's no graves in Egypt? That's the one thing. That'd be like saying, no, oh, because there's no uh, casinos in, in New Mexico? It's like, hello? You can't go more than 10 miles in any direction without running into one, you know. So, I mean, that was just a crazy thing to say. And they said, so because there's no graves in Egypt, that's why you took us to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt so with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Isn't it amazing how they forgot? That was what they said at the beginning. Remember when Moses went and talked to him and didn't give what God told him to say? Remember God said, you tell him if you don't let my people go... He said, this is my firstborn. If you don't let my people go, God said he's going to kill your firstborn, Pharaoh. And remember Moses, when Aaron went to Pharaoh, and says, you should let us go or else God's going to fall on us and judge us. He changed the consequence of disobedience. And then Pharaoh added on more work. And they said, see, you just leave us alone. Come on, Moses, you're messing things up. So they go way back to that. We told you don't do this. How quickly people forget what life was like B.C. What life was like before we came to Christ. The enemy is so good, is he not? At, even our flesh is good at We remember some of the things we did before we came to Christ. Oh man, that was amazing. We had every Thursday night off. 
And we partied all the time with no guilt. It was fantastic, you know. And we forget about the hangovers. We forget about the arguments. We forget about the emptiness. We forget about the lack of hope and the fear of death. We forget about all the stuff that went with our before Jesus life. And that's where they're at. So, oh, man, we're trapped in it. It had been better just to serve Pharaoh. Now we're going to be out here. We're dead. This is horrible. Oh, man, and they're really bummed out. I said, Moses, why did you do this? Remember, it wasn't Moses that did this. It was the Lord that did this. Because he's about to teach these new followers of his some very important truths. Now, I'm still a new believer, and God is still trying to teach me these truths. And it's like, ah, I wish I would just learn it so he'd have to stop teaching me. But I keep going up, I keep ending up in cul-de-sacs, you know. And it's like, oh, Lord, we're in trouble this time. This is, the, this is sort of like the Sanford and Son. This is the big one, you know. Oh, man, I'm stuck. I'm caught. This is it. This is it. God, you've been faithful throughout my entire life, but this is the time. I'm all done now. It's, it's it. That's where they're at. So why in the world would God bring his people into a spiritual cul-de-sac using physical tightnesses and squeezing and then bringing Pharaoh on in so it's completely, oy vey, we're in trouble, you know, because he's showing his children it's a walk by faith, not by sight. And I'd like us to turn to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, Verse 19, it says this. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Children of Israel, God is going to show you. He's got you. The world might be closing in. There's no way this can possibly happen but God. And God loves to put his kids into that position where it's like, well, there you go. Impossible now, huh? And then there's God. And we go, whoa, he did it again, you know. And then two days later, take a right, another cul-de-sac. Oh, this is the worst one this time. God, then he does it again. Anybody been in cul-de-sacs besides me? Amen. Isn't that amazing to see what God does? So remember that. Get our eyes off the Egyptians coming on in. Get off our eyes off of the cul-de-sac and just get them on the Lord and say, God, what do you have for me here? This is some serious stuff, God. Hey, this is a big old mess. I'm glad you're God because we'd be in trouble. But I'm just going to continue to follow you. Amen. And we're going to see what happens here in just a minute. But not only here, but remember in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We'll take a look at that too. We'll just take a quick look. Some of the cul-de-sacs are not just, oh man, we're being squeezed in. But in 1 Corinthians 10, we see sometimes even the cul-de-sacs have to do with temptations. Verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. When we're in a spiritual cul-de-sac and there's temptation all around, don't look at the temptation. Lift our eyes up, look to the Lord. And God will lead you out of that cul-de-sac. And he's going to show the children of Israel. They're tempted to go back. Remember what a picture this is of the new believer. They're just new following the Lord. They've just placed their faith in the blood of the Lamb. Now they're coming on out, and they're in this cul-de-sac. It would have been better if we never would have done this. We should have just stayed where we were. This is crazy, man. This is nuts. And they're complaining. They cry out to God, but they cry out to God in complaint to Moses. And as we continue on, Verse 13, they're short memories. 13, and Moses said to the people, and this is the key of the whole chapter. We're going to summarize some things we learn at the end of our study tonight, but right here, this verse is kind of that hinge verse. Moses says to the people, they're complaining about Moses. 
you got to wonder, Moses going, oh man, I got a bunch of them out here, and this is how we start off, and they're just complaining. It's been a couple of days in the wilderness, and Mur. And Moses says to the people, I love this because God has not told Moses what's going to happen yet. He just said, go here. He knows he heard God say, go to this cul-de-sac. And now here come the Egyptians. And God says, I'm going to have the people come and get glory. So Moses is going to have to take God at his word, and he does. So he turns to the people, and he says, don't be afraid. You're feeling penned in? Don't be afraid. Don't freak out. Get her eyes off the Egyptians. It's looking pretty serious. Get her eyes off the Egyptians. Get her eyes off the pressure. Get her eyes off the mountains on both sides and the Red Sea in front of us. And the Egyptians coming behind us like, oh! Get her eyes off of that. Get her eyes off of that. Don't be afraid. We know how that works. He says, don't be afraid. Stand still. Don't despair. Despair, what does that do? That just casts us down. Don't despair. Oh, this is horrible. Then we get all depressed. Usually, depression comes from looking at the Egyptians rather than looking to the Lord. I'm just down. <laughs> Lift your eyes to the Lord. Despair gets us down. Don't fear. Fear causes us to retreat. We're following the Lord on our path. And, yeah, you're back. No, don't fear. Don't fear. Don't be impatient. We know what impatience does. Impatience causes us to do something now. Oh, man, we've got to do it now. <sighs> One of the, there's very few things, but there are a few things that I find getting older is good for. One is, is you're more patient. And I don't know if it's because you're just tired. I don't know what it is. When you're young, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. You just jump, let's try this, let's try that. You're just out there. And the older you get, the more patient you get. And let's just, let's just see what God's going to do. Let's just calm ourselves and let God. Impatience causes us to do something now. It doesn't say to be impatient. And presumption, don't, be, don't presume. In this case, presumption would have us just jump in the Red Sea right now. Well, he says, he's gonna, let's just jump in there, see what he does. No, don't jump in the Red Sea yet. He says, don't be afraid. Stand still. Nine years ago, we'd have said, calm yourself. Just chill. Feel closed in. Don't be afraid. Stand still. Stand still is a good thing to be doing. If we stand still, it helps us not fight the battles in our flesh. The flesh, we've got to do something. That old adage we say over and over and over again, don't defend yourself. You're being closed in, don't defend yourself. Don't be afraid. You're being attacked. Don't defend yourself. Just stand still. If we stand still, notice what he says, and see the salvation of the Lord. The old adage is, if you defend yourself, God will let you. If you don't defend yourself, God will be your defense. So just falsely accused, it's all right. Don't get caught up in the fray. Rightfully accused? Well, repent. Thank God for the accuser. Lord, thank you for bringing that person that hates my guts to point this out so I can get right. That's awesome. They might hate my guts. I love them. God, you use them. This is fantastic. So either way, you win. If it's true, repent. If it's not true, God will deal with it. Don't ever get caught up in that stuff. That is the way of the world. That's not godly. Don't get dragged down. Don't be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Oh, man, that had to, be, that had to just sound really good. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Don't be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. The Lord's going to fight for you, so hold your peace. Just trust God. 
It's pretty good. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, just one verse, Hebrews 11, 29. It talks, we may read a little bit more since we've been studying Moses a little bit. We can look a little summation of his life. That might be fun. Hebrews 11, verse 23. We'll just read about Moses quick. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. That's, that's the parents' faith. Because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. And there it is at verse 29. It summarizes chapter 14 of Exodus. In the Old King James, it says, By faith they walked through the Red Sea. And I looked up this word past or walked, and past does imply a walk, not a run. And I found that interesting. Because now let's take a look at this. Just keep that in our mind. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. <clears throat> that is so interesting. You see, there's a time to pray, and there's a time to act. And it's important we make that distinction. Praying is important, but if it's just praying and there's no action, that's a bad spot to be in. And what does God tell Moses? Why are you crying to me? It's the praying time has ceased, Moses. It's now time <coughs> to get going. Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift Lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Which Egyptians? The ones that are still back in Egypt. What happened to the army? They got drowned in the Red Sea. Now they're going to know. And the angel of God, that is called a theophany or a Christophany. Remember that term, theophany or Christophany. It is the second person of the Godhead. It's Jesus, the Son of God, showing up in the pages of Scripture, the Son of God showing up in the midst of mankind before Bethlehem. So we'll see him from time to time showing up in Scripture. In many of your Bibles, you'll see angel is capitalized. Not in the original text. They've done that in the translation to help us spot, oh, a theophany here, or a Christophany, either word. Theos for God or Christos for, for Christ, the anointed one. But it's Jesus in the Old Testament. And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud, remember we talked about the Spirit of God there, went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. So now the Egyptians are moving in. God is leading them. He leads them up to the Red Sea into this cul-de-sac. Now he goes and stands between the children of Israel and their rear ranks and the approaching Egyptian army. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, in verse 20. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to one, the Egyptians, and it gave light by night to the other, the children of Israel, so that one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Now, it's interesting in the Hebrew, from my limited understanding of Hebrew, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off of just a couple of people who do know Hebrew, and they say it seems to imply 
that when they went into the midst of the sea, it's that same picture we have when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River in the book of Joshua. When they crossed, remember the Jordan River, and it says as you go forward, as their, their feet hit the water, it starts to back up. They said it seems to imply from the word pictures in the Hebrew that crossing the Dead Sea, it wasn't like, whew, let's go. It was like right up to the sea. And as you walk, it just keeps parting. It's, I love that picture. I don't know if that's right, but I've got two different sources on it. So I'm going to say, check it out. But it's interesting. It's an interesting thing. So it says that they, they walk in. The waters were a wall on the right and the left. And the Egyptian pursued and went after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, one guy, one guy, I am so away, there's no pulpit, I have to even, but I'm not by the pulpit. My Bible's closed, it's behind me. One guy I was reading this week, it was so interesting, and I'm not saying this happened, but what a picture it was. Because he said, you realize that this cloud completely darkened everything around the Egyptians. So think of a tremendous fog or something. It's just, you don't see anything. The children of Israel have light, so they're going across the sea. However long the sea is, there's, where it was, who knows? Most people think it was like one of the rabbit ears of the Red Sea, the one to the, to the west there, uh, the Suez Canal portion of it. And many people use towards the top of that, just a couple miles down from the, top, the tip of that. So it might have been an eight or ten mile crossing, who knows? But we don't know where it is, so who knows? But they said, realize that this cloud would be light to the, to the Israelis, so they've got a big spotlight. They're, they're just going, and they're walking through this, and they're walking. The Egyptians, well, let's go, guys. Let's just go. Well, I can't see it. Just go. So they're just going. And this guy said, is it possible that is, by the time they got there, they're just going, and they say, wow. And they're just walking. They don't even realize. They've got dry land. They're just walking. And then the cloud lifts, and they look, and they go, well, this isn't good. And they turn in book and their wheels are coming off their chariots, they're stuck, and it's like, oh my goodness, what a mess. Who knows? That's just one guy's thought. So back to the word. But at any rate, what we do know, Moses stretched out his hand, the Lord caused the sea to go back by strong east wind. In verse 22, the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground. The waters were a wall on the right and the left. The Egyptians pursued, went after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen, the whole army's in there. Now it came to pass in the morning watch, that's 2 to 6 a.m. in the morning. So there it is at 2 to 6 in the morning that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. He troubled the army of the Egyptians and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let's flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. We've got a problem retreat, you know. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Let's go to the next slide, Sandy. Some lessons learned before we go to the end of the chapter. Hit the first one. We remember from 419 of Philippians that God is able. God is able to supply all our needs. The next one. God makes a way of escape. Not only of temptations, even every cul-de-sac we find ourselves in. Whether we walk in there or if God leads us, when we, we wander into a cul-de-sac of our own making, our own decisions, cry out to the Lord. Repent and let God give you a way out. He will. It is interesting. Here we see the Egyptian army trying to get involved, getting through that Red Sea. Trying to do the very thing that the children of God had done. Remember Moses and the children of Israel went through there, as we saw in Hebrews, by faith. And now we see unbelievers, the Egyptians, trying to accomplish that which the believers accomplished. Unbelievers trying to accomplish by sight that which the believers of God accomplished by faith. 
that will always fail. That will always fail. And the, the thing with that principle is that is true also with believers. I remember Pastor Chuck telling us this a long time ago when we, I was part of the Calvary Chapel movement and there was a, a many pastors. It was a mandatory, if you're a senior pastor in the world, you had to be at this conference. There's 800, 900 senior pastors only. So there's everybody, you're there. And if Pastor Chuck said be there, you were there. People being carried on stretchers, and, but you're showing up. <laughs> well, maybe not stretchers, but you get the idea. But it was interesting because he said, you know, fellas, the Calvary Chapel is not a franchise. And he says, some of you seem to think it's a franchise. And then I remember, I remember because Whoops, that's what I did. But he said, you know, you go on to a community, you rent a storefront, you put some chairs in it, and you teach the Word and say, okay, I'm a Calvary, now it's going to grow. He says, you think that teaching the Word is how it grows. He says, no, God adds to it. It's a God thing. He says, if you don't have a hunger for the Word, why would anybody else that you teach? He says, yes, expository teaching, of course, that's the Calvary Chapel style. That's what we do. But there are other churches that don't do that and they have growth. And we can't just, well, they don't teach the word, they're no good. No, they're just different. But the Calvary Chapel model is to find someone who actually enjoys reading and studying the word of God. Now just do that. And let God work through his word to grow people. Not numbers, but grow individuals in their walk with the Lord. Let them see the love of God. Let them see the forgiveness of God. Let them see the mercy of God. Let them see the power of God from the pages of Scripture. But it's not enough just to put a Calvary Chapel sign up and say, I'm going to teach the Bible and think, okay, it's going to grow now. That's, even if it does, that's just going to be you. It's the Spirit of God. The Lord adds the increase. Individually and numerically. It's a God thing. So as we look at this, unbelievers or believers misinformed try to accomplish by sight that which believers have accomplished or seen God accomplish by faith. That'll always lead to failure. Always, always, always. Verse 30. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. Tremendous work. The plagues all over the place. Now the parting of the Red Sea. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Is that last bullet point up, Sandy? This is what we want to remember as we leave. If God is for us, who can be against us? No matter what cul-de-sac we find ourselves in, if you're walking with the Lord and say, I'm walking with the Lord and this is a mess, well then just trust God. This is good. This is good. This is good. If we're in a cul-de-sac which we shouldn't be in, well then we repent. Because with every situation, God gives a way out. And that way out is to look to Him and repent and let God take us on out. So, the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea, one of the major events in the Old Testament that shows the power of God, the glory of God, the love of God for his people, how God can be a blessing to his own at the same time be a judge to his enemies. It's an, it's an amazing thing that we see here in the parting of the Red Sea. So, as we go tonight, just know we got a great God. And if he's for us, who can be against us? Now we got to just chill and trust God. And be thankful for the cul-de-sacs he brings us into because they're... They're faith builders for us. And um, <sighs> love those cul-de-sacs, you know. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the example we see here. God, we know you are in control of all things. And God, we're asking even now that your spirit would move in our midst. Lord, that you would speak to your people God, you would prepare your people. We look forward to not being afraid, standing still, seeing your salvation, holding our peace, and we stand ready to give you glory again. God, help us to uh, walk by faith, not by sight. We're truly going to trust you. 
We pray for a safe trip back for the girls, for Mindy and Riva and Sharon. Ask you watch over them. We thank you for their willingness to go into Honduras and work with the orphans down there. And God, we pray for safe return home. We look forward to hearing all that you have done. We pray for the outreach coming up to Honduras again and also in Bulgaria now, God. We pray that you go before those that are going, keep them safe, use them to be a tremendous blessing. In Jesus' name.